Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Romans, with this sermon entitled, Our Perpetual Debt of Love. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. As I studied and, and prepared this week, um, I, I kind of wanted to go a little bit further than we're going, and then I kind of got hung up on something. And I uh, was talking to Scott and said, we're kind of taking a, a side road um, a little bit this morning, and then just kind of landing on something that's just really simple. Um, but it's a necessary side road that we take um, just because we, part of our, our job as elders is to equip the body, um, not just to, um, to to educate um, as we go through God's Word together and see what things meant in their original context and um, how that applies to our, our lives and um, be able to really defend or, or have conversations with people that may um, misuse or not um, understand the, the point that the original author is making. And so we're, we're going to go kind of down a side road this morning, but um, we'll pick up in uh, Romans 13, verse 8. Um, Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And so uh, this morning the side road that we're going to kind of take is to ask the question, what does Paul mean um, when he says, we'll take these off, let's try that. Uh, Owe no one anything. And so before we can talk about what he means, um, we need to really think about what he doesn't mean. Um, and so I have had conversations with people um, that I've worked with or, or people that I've been friends with, and, and um, they kind of misuse this passage or, or take it out of context. And their claim is that uh, Paul is making an absolute moral law here uh, that would prohibit uh, any of us from, from borrowing. And so they would say that the, the loan on your house or, or a loan that you use to buy a car or um, the money that you may have borrowed to go to college um, is sinful and unbiblical. Um, and so that, that is, that's a problem. Um, and that can send especially newer believers or uh, less mature believers uh, into kind of a, a tailspin where they're kind of scratching their heads and saying, okay, is, is that the case? Is, if I take a loan out um, to buy my house, is that, that sinful? Is that something that God does not want me to do? And so um, that's why some of our time this morning, much of our time, uh, will be spent to hopefully refute um, that claim and, and, and examine um, what Paul is, is saying. And so... Uh, every week as we think about the kids and have a word for the kids, uh, this week our, our word is going to be O. Oh. Um, and so that's to be obligated to uh, or required to pay or repay another person for something received. And so that can be in the sense of borrowing. Uh, maybe you you know borrow money from a friend. Uh, uh, I need a quarter. I need a, a gumball out of the machine and I don't have one. Can I borrow a quarter? I'll pay you back. Um, or it can be a, a sense of payment. And so if you go to Bojangles or McDonald's and you make your order, um, you know, you, you, you owe them money because you're purchasing something uh, that they're supplying for you. And so it can be thought about in, in both of those terms, and that's important to, to keep in the back of our mind. Uh, again, the claim of some is that Paul is prohibiting uh, Christians from borrowing. Um, and, and so if that were true, uh, I, I think many people that do make that claim kind of don't think about all of the implications that that would involve in our daily life. Because how many of you have ever said, hey, can I borrow that pencil? Right? 
or, or, or how many of you have been somewhere, um, you go out to eat uh, lunch with a friend, and you get there, and you're getting ready to pay, and you're like, ugh, I forgot my wallet, can you get me, and I'll, can you spot me, and I'll, I'll pay you back. Um, Paul doesn't say, don't owe money to anyone, he says, owe no one anything, and so that would in- include all of those things. Um, and, and really, that's a... I can't see you when I don't have my glasses on. This is going to bother me. I need bifocals. We need to make an appointment. Um, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, it, it's a good thought practice. Um, this, and this is something that's good with any kind of idea that you hear or any worldview that you hear. Um, to kind of think about that and what the implications are and take those out to their fullest extent uh, and think about what someone is is really saying when they make a a truth claim. Um, And so how would we determine if Paul is stating an absolute moral law here? Um, A a good starting point for that is to look at the entirety of Scripture. Um, Anytime we have a question about something that, that God's Word says, Um, it's helpful and beneficial not to to just look at one place, um, but to to look at the the full revelation of of God's Word that He has given to us. Um, Because God's Word doesn't contradict itself. Um, There are, people have written books about seemingly uh, contradictive statements in in Scripture. Um, And and we need to understand that there is unity and there is a congruency Um, in Scripture, uh, that Scripture testifies to itself, it affirms itself, uh, and we need to recognize that when we study. And so if there there does seem to be a place where something seems contradictory, um, we need to wrestle with the text and examine those. Uh, Pay attention to the historical context and the grammatical context. And so uh, the historical context is who is the original audience? Uh, what's the, the setting? What are the circumstances ar- around what God says or what someone says uh, in God's Word? And then the, the grammatical context is um, how are they saying that? Um, what is said? Uh, is this a, is it a principle or is this really a, a command of God? Um, and so those are some things to think about uh, as we navigate those those texts, and today as we think about borrowing and incurring uh, debt, and so uh, the Bible does say uh, there are there are some negative passages about borrowing, and and we would not be honest; we would be dishonest if we didn't acknowledge those. Um, and so Proverbs twenty two seven uh, says, "The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender." And this proverb. Um, this, this is coming from the wisdom of, of Solomon. And hopefully you know that story about how God offered Solomon anything that he wanted. And um, he, he asked for wisdom. And that, that pleased God that Solomon asked for wisdom. Now some of the things that Solomon did were unwise. Um, but he gained wisdom from those experiences. Um, and he wrote those down in, in the book of Proverbs. And so um, this is not a command. Uh, this is just kind of a, a general maxim. This is something that, that Solomon observed in his life. Um, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a slave of the lender. The rich over the poor, ruling over the poor. Just this week I was listening to uh, Albert Moeller and he was talking about uh, kings and those in high authority positions of authority often misused their their power. And even uh, Plato, 400 years before Christ, was was thinking about a, a philosopher king. And he, he kind of made the statement that if there was a king that, every, that pleased everyone, he would be a, a corrupt king and, and be so good at selling lies um, that he would have everybody fooled. But if there was a philosopher king that society really needed to, to flourish and uh, to pursue justice, that everyone would, would hate him because he would be um, so rigid and, and so pure in, in what he did that people wouldn't, wouldn't like that because it would kind of impact what they wanted to do. Um, and, and that was 400 years before Christ. And, and we see that when Jesus comes, he, he's rejected. Um, and he's really kind of that philosopher king that, that Plato talked about. But um, 
so the other part of this is the, the borrower is the slave of the lender. And so again, that's something that, that Solomon um, is observing. And so he's seeing that uh, this, is a, this is a warning. This is wisdom about the dangers of accumulating debt. Uh, that you become a slave. That you're obligated to pay back what you owe. And so in, in their context, um, in the Old Testament especially... Um, that would take the form of, of becoming a bond servant. And we've talked about that in Leviticus and Exodus, um, that you would work for a set number of years uh, in service to someone to, to pay back what you, you owed. Um, and so you're limited, you're constrained uh, by that debt. Your, your time, uh, your resources, your energy, all of that is, is going to uh, be taken up by trying to, to pay back someone what you owe them. And so there is a, uh, a direct correlation that the more debt you have, um, the more of a burden you're, you're under, the greater the burden that is, is on your shoulders. And so it, it kind of ends up being like uh, being in a boat that's taking on water and, and you're trying to bail that out with a sieve. And so you're, you're doing your best, you're, you're, you're putting all this effort in, but the water is still coming in and uh, eventually you're, you're going to drown. Um, and, and so there is wisdom there um, because probably you, you know of someone that has been overcome by debt in their life or, or is trying to uh, get out of a, a, a massive amount of debt. Uh, <clears throat> but that, that's not a, a command. That's just wisdom from the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, elsewhere, in Deuteronomy 28, um, it says, The Lord will open to you His good treasury, the heavens to give the rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, uh, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall only go up and not down, if you obey the commandments of the Lord, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. And so this is in Deuteronomy. It's on the heels of the Exodus and Israel coming out of, of Egypt, um, getting ready to go into the promised land, right? Because Deuteronomy is um, the second law. When we, when we went through, walked through the Bible, it was the second law, right? And, and Moses is preaching um, these sermons to kids that didn't get the law the first time. And so uh, Moses is... is preaching to them, they're, they're um, getting ready to enter the promised land, and, and the command to Israel um, was, you shall not borrow from other nations. Um, it was possible to borrow from a fellow Israelite, uh, to someone that was in your, your tribe or in another tribe of Israel, um, and the guidelines for that borrowing and, and lending are found uh, in Leviticus chapter 25, uh, mainly, you, you weren't to profit from letting your brother or sister um, take out a, a loan. You weren't to charge interest, and, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but there were guidelines, and, and they could let other Israelites borrow. You could lend, um, but they weren't supposed to borrow from other nations. Uh, Jesus also encourages us to lend to those in need. Uh, so we come to Matthew chapter 5, verse 42. Uh, these are Jesus' words, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And so if, if we think about that, and, and what that would mean if this was a, an absolute moral law from Paul, um, Jesus says, lend. When someone wants to borrow, lend. Uh, and so if we do that and borrowing is sinful, then wouldn't our lending be complicit to their sin? Wouldn't that be enabling someone else's sin? Um, you kind of look at that as the, like the transitive property. Can I use the transitive property in English? Or does it have to just stay in math? I can. So it, it, but it, it's like the transitive property. So if, if it's sinful to borrow and, and Keith comes to me wanting to borrow money and I lend to him, then I'm being complicit in that sin. Does that make sense? You follow that? Uh, and so that can't be the point that, that Paul is trying to make. Um, the Bible does speak highly of those that have the ability um, and the generosity to help other people. Uh, Psalm thirty-seven twenty-six says, "He is ever lending generously, and his children become a blessing." And so this is this is a psalm describing a righteous man that is 
following God, that wants to follow God. Um, and it says not only does this man lend, um, but apparently his, his children are learning from his example. And so they're going to bless other people later on in their life. They're going to, to give and lend generously, uh, learning by their parents' example. Uh, Psalm 112.5 says, It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. And so uh, lending can be a form of generosity, uh, but it can also take the form of, of abuse. Um, it takes the form of generosity um, when it is fair, uh, when it is just and it is helping someone in need, uh, but it takes the form of abuse when it is unjust, um, when it is the approach of, of kind of preying on the weak. And so uh, Israel could lend to other nations. We saw that in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy uh, but they weren't to borrow. And so the big question is, is why? Why were, were, why were they not allowed to borrow? Uh, it, and it's because of that same maxim that we saw in Solomon, that he, he kind of speaks about being uh, a slave to the lender. Uh, that debt would create kind of a, a bondage or enslavement for Israel. And they had just come out of slavery, right? And so um, God does not want His people uh, to become enslaved again through, through borrowing from these other nations. Uh, he wants his people to be, we saw, uh, he says, you'll be the head, not the, not the tail. Uh, he wanted them to lead and, and be free, uh, not be burdened and obligated uh, and indebted to other nations around them. And so we have to remember that context of, of where that's at, uh, who God is, is speaking to and, and what is going on uh, in the history of those passages. Um, but these passages do give us uh, wisdom and discernment for, for borrowing and lending. And so, uh, in our lending, one of the, the big questions we have to ask ourselves is, can I afford to do this? Uh, do I have the ability to, to lend, or could this potentially put me, enslave me later? Um, if I lend this now and, and I really don't have the means to do that, um, then I could end up in further debt my, myself. Uh, another question is, am I doing this to uh, help someone uh, to be a benefit to them, or am I doing this so I can hang it over their head um, and, and they'll owe me and I can keep them uh, indebted to me, owing me a, a favor? Um, and so the biblical idea is when we lend, uh, we want to alleviate a problem, uh, not further aggravate uh, a problem. Um, we, we don't want to lend in a way that adds further obstacles or challenges for those people that we're lending to. We, we want to be a blessing to them, uh, be a, a help, a benefit uh, to them. Uh, but there are also things that we can learn from God's Word in borrowing. Uh, and again, one of the, the first questions that we can ask is, is what is my motivation uh, for borrowing? What is the, the need that I am addressing here? Uh, because in, in their context, uh, they would borrow to alleviate poverty. Um, they would borrow because really their, their life depended on that. Um, this is an agrarian society. Um, Israel was an agrarian people. And so you have a, uh, a bad crop. Um, the crops don't grow. They get a disease. There's a famine or, or something like that that happens. Uh, you're, you're in real trouble uh, because you have a family that you need to feed and you have no crops. And so what are you going to, to do? Uh, and so that is often why those bond-servant relationships were formed, is my crops didn't do good, but my neighbors did, and so I'll become bond-servant to them, um, and, and they'll help feed my family, and I'll, I'll work off that uh, debt through, through labor and service. It was a, a way to provide uh, a family's basic needs, uh, food, water, shelter, clothing. Um, and there are similar situations that we could kind of compare that to today, uh, maybe uh, you have a, an unseen medical emergency. And so now you've got a lot of, uh, you, you've spent an, some time in the hospital. There are uh, unforeseen medical bills, expenses that you, you, you couldn't plan for. Uh, you're kind of blindsided by those. Uh, and now you're, you're in trouble. And we've, we've helped people that have been in those situations. Or maybe um, someone in your family passes away and they did not make... 
uh, preparations with the, the funeral home. And so you have funeral expenses that you have to, to help cover um, those kind of things that arise. Um, but this is, this is not borrowing uh, on a whim for, for a want or a luxury. Uh, and this is where we need wisdom and discernment. Uh, it's important to um, consider the categories of needs and wants. Um, parents, it's important to teach your kids about those categories. Amen? Amen. It, it is. Um, is this something that I need to survive? Or is this motivated by maybe greed or pride or envy? Um, now, listen, there, there's nothing wrong with purchasing something that you want. Um, nothing wrong with going on nice vacations, uh, getting new appliances, uh, spending money on entertainment. Uh, but the warning is that those things can enslave us. Uh, our desires can enslave and control us. And so that can lead to financial spending that, that we're not prepared to, to spend. It can uh, lead to borrowing money that we can't pay back. And so uh, our desires enslave us, and that can lead to, to financial enslavement. And now we're, we're doubly enslaved, right? Um, so there's two things that are, are trying to control us. And so we have to be aware of that when we are uh, borrowing money to, to spend on things. Um, the other thing to, to consider is the Bible speaks very highly of being content uh, with what we have, uh, enjoying what God has provided and, and counting our blessings rather than making a list of complaints uh, about things that God has not blessed us with. Um, speaks highly of living within our means, uh, so that we can give and, and bless others who are in need uh, to be able to support <clears throat> and help them. Um, and again, these are things that we need to, to consider. And, and parents, we need to teach our kids. And uh, not only teach our kids, uh, but the harder part of this oftentimes is we need to model that uh, for our kids. And, and that can be the hard part. And so, again, uh, in context... We need to remember that these, uh, in the Old Testament, they, they weren't making capital investments. Um, and by capital investment, I mean, you know, maybe your home, uh, maybe the, the vehicle that you purchased to drive to work or, or your college loans. Uh, those, are, those are investments. You're, you're expecting uh, a return for that money that you're, you're borrowing. And so um, the value of my home, when I have a home loan and I'm, I'm purchasing a home, uh, the idea is hopefully that the value of that house will increase over time. And so if I needed to sell that house, I could recoup that money and, and even make a profit off of that uh, sale. Or when we think about a college loan, uh, the idea is that uh, I, I take out this loan to go to college, but that education will uh, put me in a place where I can earn more income uh, than I would without that uh, degree. Uh, or the, the car that you purchase. Um, you know, that's an investment of, you know, I, I have this car, now I can get to work and, and make money. Um, and so we, we can't really compare uh, apples to oranges. Uh, we live in a, a very different kind of economy uh, than the people of the Old Testament and, and even the New Testament. Um, but we still want to follow and, uh, and teach and model sound biblical principles. Uh, that we want to live lives of, of contentment and, and count our blessings, um, that we want to manage our, our resources in such a way that we uh, bless, can bless others in need. Uh, we want to live within our means. And, and really, um, we, we don't want to borrow out of financial weakness. Uh, we want to borrow out of financial strength um, so that we're, we're not becoming enslaved by debt. Uh, and biting more off than we can chew. And so again, that, just that statement of, of not borrowing out of financial weakness, but borrowing out of financial strength, hopefully you parents understand what I'm talking about there and, and making investments and um, knowing how to, to budget and, and doing all of those things and, and those things that are, are things that we're teaching uh, our children and, and those are things that we can even model and, and teach younger adults um, that may not have the experience uh, that we have with how money works and how life works. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the biblical principles that we see is that we, we pay back those we owe. 
Uh, Proverbs 37, 21 says, The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. And so we, as Christians, um, and again, thinking about being model citizens uh, in society, uh, we are obligated to pay back those that we owe. That should be part of our character. It should be naturally who we are um, so that people will know that we are uh, men and women of integrity, uh, that we are, are trustworthy, that we're honest and, and dependable people. Um, and so now we're, we're starting to get a little closer to, to Paul's point, and that's simply just pay those whom you owe. Um, and, and that's in context. Um, Romans 13, before this, it says, Pay to all what is owed them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed, owe no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And so there's something very important here. Um, those things that Paul is listing, uh, taxes, uh, revenue, th- those are things we pay someone for a service. And so we pay taxes to the government um, because they provide services to their citizens. Um, we pay the salaries of officials, uh, fund projects that the government is, is doing. Uh, revenue is, is having an employee and, and paying that employee for, for work done. Uh, and then honor because someone has a, a position, uh, probably of a authority, uh, or has a position that we should respect the, the position that they're in. Uh, and, and so now we, we are really starting to get to the, the gist of things. Um, Paul says, if you owe someone something, um, pay them back. But don't really uh, owe anyone anything except for to love someone. And so the, the only debt that we should continually owe, uh, is the only debt that we can never pay in fully, is to love someone. Uh, and that debt is not because of what that person has done for us. And, and this is kind of where the penny drops. Uh, we are in their debt because of what God has done for us. And, and so because God has loved us, we have a debt of love to other people. Uh, God has shown His love to us through the cross, and so now we are obligated to show His love and, and be loving to others. And so this is a, a perpetual debt um, I can never say, I, I don't have to love Keith anymore. I've got all my love paid up, and so I can be a jerk. Um, we, we can't say that. It's something that we never fully pay off. Um, we are obligated to love them because God loves them, and we belong to God. And uh, so that's something that we will always be uh, in their debt to. And again, we have to frame this in, in a very important context. We, we don't do this to become saved. We do this because we are saved, because we are following God. Um, we want to follow after His example, um, not out of duty, but, but out of delight. And so uh, we honor God when we love others. And so Paul says that love is a summary of all of the commandments, and so um, Exodus 20, we talked about that this morning in, in Sunday school. Um, God gives His commandments to Israel, and, and many of those speak about how we are to relate to other people. And, and God gave some very specific laws uh, that we are to follow, and, and kind, Paul kind of lists those out. Uh, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. Um, Paul lays those very specific commands out for us, um, but later... Uh, in Leviticus 19.18, after giving Israel all of those kind of specifics, he, he summarizes the law for them and says, just love your neighbor as yourself. That, that will fulfill all of those laws. Uh, and so this is God's motivation behind those specifics. Uh, this is the umbrella that all of those fall under. And, and Paul says, uh, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Um, and really, uh, that's not a fulfilling, so again, that's, that's not a fulfilling so we can go to heaven. Um, because he's already told us in Romans uh, earlier that nobody fulfills the law, right? Um, but kind of what he's saying here, the Greek word is uh, pleorma. And it means the fullness, or um, this is 
the heart behind the law. And that's what God has uh, told his people in, in Leviticus, uh, that this is the, the heart of the law when you do this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul adds, he, he defines that love for us. Love does no wrong uh, to a neighbor. And, and we've talked about this in weeks past. This doesn't mean that we, we can't ever disagree with people. Um, doesn't mean that we can't ever challenge their thinking or their worldview. Uh, doesn't mean that we can't warn other people about the dangers of, of sin um, and that one day they're going to stand before a holy God uh, and be judged. Um, it means that, when, that we don't do something evil uh, towards someone, that we always have their best interest, that we always have concern for the other person uh, at heart. And so um, that was kind of a, a long trek uh, to get there. Uh, but that's what Paul means when he says, Oh, no one anything uh, but to love. And um, this, is, this is what I need God to bring to my mind. I, I don't know about you. Um, but this is what I need God to bring to my mind when I interact and, and talk with other people. Um, that every person that I have a conversation with, every uh, cashier at the grocery store, the person bagging the groceries, every person taking your order at lunch today, um, after service, we owe them love. If we can really let that take root in our hearts, guys, our, our interactions with other people would be different. Um, they may be a stranger. We, we owe them love. They may have offended you. Uh, they may not have been as fast getting to your table with your drinks and your food. Um, we, we owe them love. Um, and, and here's the kicker. How, how can we not love them when I was a stranger to God and He loved me? I offended God and He loved me. And, and this is the, the thing that we want to take hold of. Um, that God saw my need. And uh, he came to my aid as Savior. And God saw how stubborn and sees <laughs> currently how stubborn I can be. And he's patient and he's gentle and he's kind. He forgives me even when I'm rebellious and I sin against him. He loved me when I was a stranger and had nothing to offer him. Um, and and that's, our, that's our model. Just like, as I just said a few minutes ago, we need to model that to our kids. Our Heavenly Father has modeled what it means to love others for us. Um, so God, give me a heart like that. Give us uh, a heart like that. Um, help me have compassion. Help me be empathetic. Um, talking about that in, in Sunday school. And, and, you know, sometimes we talk to people and they want to come to us with problems and, and we think nothing of it or we think, you know, <laughs> if that's all you got to complain about, God help you. Um, but we really need to have an empathetic ear. We need to listen um, as people share their, their burdens with us because um, we're not all in the same place um, in our walk with God. Um, some of us have, have weaker faith than others. Some of us can handle more. Um, but we need to be there for for each other. Um, so God, help us to, to love as we have been loved. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And uh, we just thank you for your word. And um, this is so simple, but it's so hard for us, if we're honest. And uh, there are people that we don't want to love. Um, there are people that we get frustrated and aggravated with, people that we get impatient with. Um, God, continue to, to bring your love to our memory. Um, lead us by the Holy Spirit. Uh, help us to, to be a lot to other people and uh, show them the same kind of love that you showed us, a love that is not selfish, but that is uh, sacrificial and giving and uh, patient and kind. And, uh, God, just help us to be a lot in our community. Um, God, be with our, our mission partners. We lift them up to you again and um, be with uh, some medical decisions that have to be uh, made and, and recovery processes. Uh, God, be with those that aren't here this morning uh, because of sickness. 
And uh, we just lift up our body and uh, our church family. And I ask that you continue to change us by your word and uh, mold us more and more in your image and uh, help us to to glorify and honor you because you're worthy. In uh, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.